Welcome to this ICTD seminar on tax and informality. My name is Vanessa Van den Bogard. I'm a research fellow at the International Center for Tax and Development, where with Max Galin, I co-lead the research program on tax and informality. Today, Max and I will be giving an introductory overview to key issues related to tax and informality. We're so grateful to have you here. Thank you for joining us. This lecture is divided into four sections. First, Max will give an introduction to the concept of informality. He'll then proceed to discuss key issues around taxing the informal economy. I'll then rejoin you to discuss the topic of informal taxation and revenue generation. Together, Max and I will conclude by highlighting what we see as a productive research agenda for those that are interested in, in doing research uh, on tax and informality. So with that, I will hand it to you, Max. Thank you, Vanessa, and um, welcome from my end as well. My name is Max Galin. I co-lead the informality and tax work at the ICTD together with Vanessa, and I'm a research fellow at the Institute of Development Studies. Um, so welcome to the today not very sunny Brighton. Um, I'll start this part of the lecture by talking very briefly about what we mean by informal. And I really mean very briefly because we could do a whole lecture series on this, but, but that is not the topic. But because we use the word informal quite a lot here, it's worth thinking a little bit about what it means. And it's most commonly connected to this idea of the informal economy, which in itself is an incredibly broad term that has been debated and redefined and recalibrated um, for, for decades. Um, but usually refers to a broad set of economic activities that are not regulated by the state in a context where similar activities are. So, for example, we often think about street vendors that might not have the same permits or registers that formal shop owners have. But again, it is, it is a very broad term and it encompasses a huge diverse amount of economic activity, which is often estimated to make up about half the global labor force and the vast majority of the labor force in what we refer to as low and middle income countries. From a tax standpoint, of course, the thing that's often most interesting are informal firms. And that again is where it becomes complicated because there are many ways to be an informal firm. There are many different relationships that firms have with different state authorities. We most frequently think here about firms that are not registered with revenue authorities, but there are a wide variety of relationships that firms could have with local authorities, with market authorities, and so on. Another thing that makes it complicated is to point out that informal work doesn't just happen in informal firms. Informal work can also happen in formal companies, um, for example, when workers are hired off the books in a construction sector, for example. And that is where we come to one of the re recurring themes of this lecture already, which is that diversity really matters and uh, that there is a huge variety within the sector and that that really matters when we think about informality and taxation. The other thing to highlight about informality is that there's often been a thinking in development um, that this is a temporary phenomenon, that this is going to go away, that as states grow and develop, uh, informal economies are going to get shrink, they're going to get subsumed in formal sectors, and this is a problem, if it's a problem, that will kind of take care of itself. And a really, really important observation to make if we're looking at the global context of informality right now is that that doesn't seem to be true. Yes, informality tends to be higher in low and middle income countries than in high income countries, um, but there's no clear one direction here. We see countries uh, on a variety of, of places within the income spectrum where informality is falling or where it is still rising. And we do see countries with sustained high growth rates, such as India, that still maintain sustained high rates of informality. So this is not something that's going away by itself or anytime soon, and it really has a more complex relationship with growth and development than we often think. The other point to make, again, if we think about this in the context of diversity, is that it is gendered in very heterogeneous ways. So if you look at this map for a moment, we see that there are parts of the world, such as North Africa or Russia, where men are much more likely to be informally employed than women. While if we look at Sub-Saharan Africa and parts of, of South Asia, that picture is reversed. It's also important to highlight here that different sectors within the informal economy are often gendered very differently, with you know, parts of you know, manufacturing in the garment context of being much more feminized than um, informal labor in a construction sector. 
All of this brings us back again to what does this matter for taxation? And the often kind of instinctive reaction to this is, well, aren't they by definition untaxed? Isn't this all just a conversation about tax dodgers? And as I said earlier already, it gets a lot more complicated than that really quickly when we think about the diversity of relationships that informal firms and firms in general have with taxing actors. So yes, they might not, an informal firm might not be registered with the revenue authority, they might not be paying some forms of taxes, but they might be paying other taxes. They often pay indirect taxes, but they also might pay local taxes to municipalities, to market agencies. They might be paying what we call informal taxes, and what Vanessa will talk about a lot more later, uh, to a wide variety of, of local and social and political actors. The next question again is this idea of, is this not a peripheral, a fleeting issue? And again, what we've seen is this does not seem to be something that's going away anytime soon. And it is something that affects a very, very large number of firms in particular in low and middle income countries. But the main point, and that leads to the next part of this lecture, which why, why we think this is a really important thing to talk about right now, is that there's been an increasing amount of policy enthusiasm in the last couple of years in thinking about informality and taxation. And in particular, that enthusiasm has been around thinking about how to tax the informal economy, how to improve the tax net and expand it into um, informal sectors, how to register informal firms that have not previously been registered with revenue authorities. And as we start thinking about what happens when states do that, remembering how broad this category of informality is and how diverse it is, is really, really critical. So all of that then brings us to current conversations around taxing the informal economy. And as mentioned, there's been an increasing policy enthusiasm as visible in op-eds, in policy pieces, and increasingly prominent discussions at tax forums around this idea of broadening the tax net of taxing the informal economy in order in particular to increase, increase revenue in low and middle income countries. And at first thought, the arguments for that seem very, very persuasive and, and quite intuitive. Um, we've just discussed that there's a very, very large informal economy that this, you know, could make up over half of the global labor force and that these are not registered with, with revenue authorities. And as a consequence of that, a lot of people have made the argument that there's very substantive untapped revenue here. And common arguments here basically um, try to get an estimate of, of the size of an informal sector in a country and then you know, estimate some fraction of that as the foregone tax income. And as a consequence of that, there's, there's been a strong argument made by some people in the policy space that there's substantive untapped revenue that can be um, maximized through taxing the informal economy and consequently contribute to uh, public revenue in um, developing countries. But revenue has not been the only argument that people have made in favor of taxing informal economies. There's also been the argument that this would somehow increase fairness, that it would level the playing field if some companies are paying formal taxes and are registered with tax authorities and others are not. That is clearly an, an unfair competition and consequently, you know, taxing the informal economy would uh, increase the uh, fairness within um, the economy itself. That has then also been extended for some to argue that uh, taxing informal businesses more effectively might increase tax morale overall, as even formal firms are seeing that you know informal firms are also being taxed, so they're not being taken for a ride, and consequently the overall tax morale as a, a function of the perception of the overall fairness of uh, revenue collection might increase. The most politically uh, interesting out of these arguments that are made for tax in the informal economy is this idea that this might build new accountability, that it might build a new social contract. And the idea behind that is the assumption that there's currently this disconnect between informal uh, firms and informally employed workers and states because they're not paying taxes, they're not contributing, but maybe they're also not building any expectations of what they're getting back. Maybe because they don't have any, um, they don't pay any taxes, they're they're not in a good position to bargain for the things they want from the state. And hence, there's this this disconnect, and that maybe paying uh, taxes being included in the tax net 
might uh, set off these kind of accountability creating conversations between uh, currently informal firms and, and future formalized firms and states to have a conversation around you know what they want from the state and maybe the type of infrastructure investments that are needed um, which is all based on this broader assumption around tax and governance that we've talked about in some of the other lectures um, and that here is being transferred to a conversation around the informal economy. So these are the uh, kind of broad arguments that are often heard in favor of taxing informal business. Now, some have made the argument that this enthusiasm around taxing the informal economy and similar policy processes in, in the last couple of years has not just been driven by the value of these arguments themselves, but has been driven by some wider political drivers, both in a domestic and international policy space. Domestically, McMoore has recently made this argument that there's a potential that taxing the informal economy and pushing attention towards taxing the informal economy is a diversionary tactic that is convenient for some politically connected actors within domestic tax policy spaces. And the assumption here is that pointing towards the informal economy as a potential revenue gain, this broad, somewhat undefined, uh, somewhat diffuse concept is a convenient way for some actors to point attention away from other actors that might be lucrative to tax, but they might have various incentives not to do so. And this could uh, include what we refer to as, as high net worth individuals or more politically connected businesses that are uh, operating in a, in a kind of semi-formal space and are not paying all taxes. And that might either be more difficult to tax, that might be politically inconvenient to tax, that might be uh, in one way or another financially connected to some actors within that policy space. So uh, for in all of these contexts, just pointing towards the informal economy as an alternative revenue source might be uh, a convenient way to push uh, public discussion away from some of these potentially more lucrative actors. It's also been very visible that some of the enthusiasm around tax in the informal economy has come from more global networks. And this has included uh, some think tanks and advocacy organizations, but has also included international financial institutions and accountancies and consultancies. And now the argument could be made that some of the reason why they are pushing for it could be ideological. It could be rooted in a um, kind of a neoliberal view of the world. Um, and it could also be rooted in an alliance or an interest in, in similar diversionary tactics that um, Mick Moore has, has suggested might be going on in a, in a domestic space. Another reason why we might think that global policy networks are, are pushing for this might be that uh, it fits neatly in with their assumptions about how informality works in the first place. Um, or it could uh, neatly fit in with the type of work that they do. So if we think about accountancies and consultancies in particular uh, that operate globally, there's an interest in pushing for ideas that are transferable between different countries and that in one way or another um, use the type of skills and uh, the type of perceptions of economies and modeling of economies that they sell. Um, so some of that might uh, also further incentivize accountancies and consultancies to advocate for these type of policies. No matter why we think this is becoming increasingly popular, the obvious next interesting question to ask is, well, how do we tax the informal economy? If it is almost by definition not taxed the same way that the formal economy is, how do we bridge that gap? And there's a variety of policy interventions that have been proposed and implemented in the last couple of years, but by far the most common is registration funds. And again, the the idea behind that is, is incredibly intuitive. So if, if, if almost by definition that the key feature of informal firms is that they're not registered with tax authorities, well, let's register them with tax authorities. And that has taken the, the, the form of, of registration drives, which are these, these targeted policy interventions that largely see to, to register uh, previously unregistered firms in a particular geographic space with revenue authorities. And both as a policy prescription and as a policy practice, that has become increasingly popular in the last couple of years, so popular that more refer to this as a registration obsession in the context of Sub-Saharan Africa. 
it's not the only policy proposal out there, and it's not the only way that people have tried to tax the informal economy. There have been a variety of, incent uh, of, um, of interventions that have sought to simplify the way that people pay taxes, to make it easier, to make it more accessible, um, but also to simplify the, by the way that we um, assess uh, the taxes that people need to pay. So presumptive taxation, for example, um, usually describes the use of indirect means to ascertain tax liability. So especially in the context of, of very small informal firms that might not um, have the same kind of bookkeeping or registration that larger firms um, do, presumptive taxation uses simple um, metrics and simple descriptions of these firms to, uh, to calculate a, a broad presumptive uh, tax liability for these firms that might be somewhat simpler to calculate and simpler to collect than the full formal set of assertions of tax liabilities. Something that we've seen a lot less in practice but discussed a little bit in the policy space has been associ associational taxation. So the use of associations within the informal space, such as informal unions, informal market associations, uh, associations of informal uh, craftsmen, or uh, just generally um, groups that bring together uh, informal clusters that work in a particular sector uh, and work with these associations to collect taxes from the members of their sector. Again, we've seen that a little bit less in practice, um, but it's also something that is often brought up in this context. So having talked about the arguments for taxing the informal economy, having talked about some of the political drivers of these, and having talked about the different ways that people have tried to do this, it is then worth taking stock and thinking about um, the past few decades of empirical experiences on taxing the informal economy and how that has gone. And one of the broader conclusions that have come out of this has been that often taxing the informal economy has not brought all the benefits that people thought it did. Often a lot of the more optimistic assumptions about taxing the informal economy that we discussed earlier have not really been brought to fruition. And that then leads us to some of the counter arguments against uh, some of these proposals and some of the challenges that are involved in them. And the first one really cuts to what has often been the most persuasive argument for taxing the informal economy, this idea that there is enormous revenue potential, that there's a missing gold mine that can be found through taxing the informal economy. Well, in fact, the practical experiences, especially with registration drives, has shown that the revenue potential of taxing informal economies is often very limited. And there's a couple of intuitive reasons why this is true. Uh, first, it's often very costly to implement these interventions. It's often difficult to register informal enterprises, especially if they are in, in difficult to reach places. More critically, a lot of activities within the informal economy are small scale survivalist activities. A lot of these are activities by already economically marginalized communities. And as a consequence, a lot of them already fall underneath um, tax thresholds. A lot of them uh, are not by any, um, any formal uh, framework required to pay a lot of taxes, uh, if any at all. And potentially more, most importantly, uh, one of the reasons why there hasn't been as much um, revenue gained through um, particular registration drives is that tax registration often doesn't necessarily imply tax payment. Uh, what we've often seen is that one of the results of large-scale registration drives have been that these have expanded tax registries, but have not necessarily expanded tax payment exactly in the same amount. And as a consequence of that, especially the more optimistic assumptions of how much revenue tax in the informal economy might bring, these broad back-of-the-napkin calculations where people say, well, you know, 50% of labor in this country is, is informal, and, you know, so hence a certain percentage of that surely will bring in revenue. A lot of these are more optimistic assumptions are often misleading. They're often also misleading because uh, these interventions often tend to target uh, those that are easier to reach for these kind of interventions. So more visible parts of the informal economy, such as street vendors, or you know, people with a, with a fixed locale. But they often fail to target some of the more high, high value actors within the informal economy, such as uh, unregistered dentists or lawyers, uh, who might be less obvious to find, or who might be less obviously associated with informality, or who might be more politically connected and otherwise able to escape these kind of drives. So for all these reasons, the registration 
the revenue potential of registration drives is often quite limited. But as we discussed earlier, the arguments for taxing the informal economy haven't always been only around revenue, but some of the other positive side effects that are often implied have also not always been forthcoming. So this idea that uh, tax in the informal economy will improve social contracts, that it will lead to more accountability, again, often hasn't materialized in practice. And the reason that people have often cited here is that accountability and, and this kind of bargaining that underlies it really needs more than just taxes. It needs communication, it, ne it needs bargaining, it needs um, collective action in a form, it needs, it needs a kind of interaction of a very particular nature. And that this interaction is often very, very hard in a, in a context of informal economies. Um, we have a lot of work that have highlighted that collective action for informal actors is difficult because it can be costly, it can be time consuming, the fact that they're already kind of on the wrong side of the law might make it difficult for them to, to act collectively. There are diversities within the sector that might make it uh, easier for some people to act collectively, but for others to get excluded. Um, they might lack uh, social or um, educational capital um, that would be needed to, to foster these kind of relationships. Or some actors of the informal economy might find it substantially easier and hence marginalize the interest of others. All of these are not to say that constructive relationships can't be built here, but it means that they're complicated to build. And that means that they're not naturally and necessarily forthcoming just because you register people in a tax registry. So again, the accountability argument is highly context dependent and it doesn't always come through. And the same then also uh, kind of goes for, for this argument that this will level the playing field and that this will um, make it fairer. And I mean, first of all, there is relatively limited evidence that tax in the informal economy will improve tax morale overall. But it's often, often also more unfair in, in, in a more particular way. As, as I just mentioned, often registration drives focus on the more visible or more kind of easily thought of actors within informal economies. So they often can focus on smaller actors within informal economies um, and, and let some of the larger actors and, and some of the um, more, more profitable unregistered actors off the hook. But also it can, in, in, in that context, double down on some actors who are already economically vulnerable, who are already marginalized and who are already uh, not kind of getting um, the services that are often associated with, with support from the state. Most critically, however, it often forgets that some of them are already paying taxes. That was that point we made earlier. The fact that um, informal actors might not start of a clean, skate, sleep, a clean slate that we just kind of tax on top of, but they're already paying uh, indirect taxes and critically, they might already be paying informal taxes. They might already be paying a variety of fees to other actors. Um, and as a consequence of that, um, they might be overtaxed as, um, as a result of new initiatives that focus in particular on extracting more taxes from the informal sector. And as a consequence of that, there might be extreme negative e equity implications of these kind of interventions that focus in particular on tax in the informal sector. And Vanessa is going to talk a little bit more about what these informal taxes that might already exist look like. Having summarized these challenges, it's important to bring that back to the discussion earlier we had about the diversity of the informal sector. So a lot of these challenges make an argument why these simple assumptions in favor of taxing the informal economy, you know, it will bring more revenue, it will increase governance, it will increase fairness, why these assumptions aren't true. And often at the heart of why these assumptions aren't true is the fact that the informal economy is more complex than the assumptions think it is. Uh, assumptions that think there's a massive revenue potential make certain assumptions about the revenue that exists within the informal economy, the kind of profits that people make. Um, and it, it really doesn't see that the diversity of actors, the fact that people straddle the formal and informal sector and have multiple activities. A lot of them are, are very marginalized. A lot of them are activities that can't be expanded. Um, it, it really doesn't, um, doesn't look at the diversity of the sector. And as a consequence from these simplistic assumptions come overly optimistic assumptions about the potential of um, 
taxing the informal economy. And again, the same goes for assumptions about how accountability relationships work in, in a context of an informal economy that doesn't consider the difficult context of being informal. Um, so what we really need in order to get a better sense of, of how tax in the informal economy works in practice, the effects that these kind of interventions have and how they could be done differently, is to really dig more into the diversity of, of actors in the informal economy. As we said earlier, this is an incredibly broad concept. Um, it's an incredibly wide kind of statistical uh, bucket in which we put all kind of different actors. So one of the priorities of research on informal economies and taxation in the last couple of years has really been to try to unpack this a little bit more and see how taxation affects different actors within the informal economy differently and what that means for these kind of interventions and their consequences and how we can protect those that need protection. It also obviously has meant that there is more research needed in this, part, in this context. And, and one area of research that it connects to particularly well is the uh, area that Vanessa is going to talk about next, which is to think about the taxes that informal actors already pay and not just informal actors. And that's thinking about informal taxes. So in this section, I am going to give an introduction to informal taxation and revenue generation. So taxation, as you probably know, has become in recent years an increasingly important item on the agenda of international development actors. So for example, through the Addis Tax Initiative, donors have committed to doubling aid related to domestic revenue mobilization with a focus on taxation as a means of financing development goals. Now, as Max described in the previous section, related policy attention has often been focused on revenue outcomes alone, which has in turn often led policymakers to focus on finding quote unquote untapped revenue in the informal economy. This is based on the assumption that businesses in the informal economy and people and households in low income countries more generally don't pay tax. We'll first explore whether or not that is true. When we look at the data, it is true that most people in low income countries pay almost nothing in direct formal taxes to governments. So looking at the average breakdown of the composition of taxes in low income countries relative to OECD countries, we see that the major difference is in the payment of direct personal income taxes. That is the blue component in the graphs. The same is true at the subnational level, where, where data shows that people often pay a very small amount in direct taxes to governments. So, for example, in various ICTD studies of local government taxation in West and Central Africa, we found that local government taxes amount on average to only about a dollar per capita annually. <laughs> Evidently, uh, this represents a, a relatively small burden on individuals while also limiting the capacity of local governments to deliver services in exchange for tax payment. However, relying on these formal statistics alone leads us to overlook the various ways in which individuals actually interact with tax systems and local public finance in low-income countries. While formal taxation is often limited, citizens often face a high, a high burden of informal payments and contributions to fund local public goods, to, to access essential local services, and to support local institutions of governance. These informal payments fill gaps in public financing and private financing through aid and philanthropy and contribute to things like schools, to teacher salaries, water wells, uh, and road and bridge construction in local areas. They do this through what we describe as small and informal taxes and user fees that make up informal systems of local public goods finance, which are often led by local leaders, community leaders, traditional authorities, politicians, or even frontline state officials. Informal revenue generation refers to a system of local public goods finance that is codified and enforced outside of the formal legal system. Uh, it includes informal taxes and user fees, as well as other non-charitable contributions. Payments may be made to state or non-state actors. So as an example, households may have to pay to a water well management committee or a caretaker in order to access water wells in their neighborhoods uh, with those informal payments helping to fund maintenance or repairs of that well. 
Similarly, individuals receiving care at a public health facility may have to make an informal payment to a nurse or a doctor in order to supplement or, or actually wholly finance the salary of those actors. Informal payments may be made in cash, in kind, or through labor. While cash payments are the easiest parallel, perhaps, to thinking about formal taxes, uh, it is often common for individuals to contribute in kind. So, for instance, providing agricultural goods in lieu of cash or preparing food for laborers working on a public goods project. Uh, well, it's also common uh, for contributions to be through labor. So in many contexts, communal labor is required on a periodic basis in order to maintain or build roads uh, or bridges in local areas. As with state taxes, uh, informal taxes and user fees exist on a spectrum. So in some contexts, they are more coercive and predatory contributing very little in practice to public goods provision uh, and effectively just taking advantage of vulnerable citizens. In other contexts though, they are more consensual. They are more clearly linked to public goods and services, are linked to local accountability mechanisms, uh, and in these contexts effectively are serving to fill gaps left by state financing. Let's take a look at a quick example of what this looks like in practice based on my research in Sierra Leone. Though education is a core duty of the state and though there has been a national policy commitment to providing free public primary education since independence, public education in Sierra Leone is financed not only by the formal government budget and through off-budget aid, but through informal contributions, taxes, and fees paid by households. Households contribute to the financing of primary public education in a variety of ways, with contributions and taxes organized and collected through parent-teacher associations, school management committees, mother's clubs, uh, and school administrations, often with the backing of local chiefs who enforce these payments. In my research in Eastern and Northern Sierra Leone, only 5% of households made no informal payments to access free public primary education with communities explaining that uh, they tax themselves in order to look after community needs. Uh, based on my survey data in, in these areas, uh, in capturing in cash, in kind, and labor contributions, I estimate that, uh, that households contribute an average of 25 US dollars annually for public education. Uh, the government Government funding is estimated at 24 US dollars annually per pupil. Uh, this was in 2017. Uh, while imperfect, uh, the estimate of household contributions illustrates the importance of informal financing uh, to delivering free universal primary public education in the country. I think it's also important to put these amounts in perspective. You may recall that I said that uh, local governments collect revenue that amounts to less than $1, one US dollar per capita annually. Uh, and in Sierra Leone, the most common formal tax paid, the local poll tax, is about 70 US cents per adult annually, highlighting that informal contributions are both a significant expense at an individual and household level, again, representing about 25 US dollars a year, and at the same time, they are effectively making up for limited formal tax efforts. So, while primary school is free across Sierra Leone, we know that it's often only possible through tax-like payments that are made at the local level, uh, particularly in rural, marginalized, and otherwise hard to reach areas. So what do we know about informal taxation and revenue generation? While research in this area has been limited, existing evidence does point to a few key findings. First, Informal taxation is often linked to essential public goods provision, particularly where there are gaps in in-state financing. Second, informal taxation is enforced through informal institutions. It's often backed by the support and enforcement power of local leaders, including traditional authorities. Uh, informal taxes may come with or may be enforced by fines uh, and sanctions, uh, importantly, it, it, they can often, punishment can often involve uh, limiting access to essential public goods. 
In other cases, it can result in uh, the failure to pay can result in social ostracization or banishment from community institutions. So these punishments can be evidently particularly, uh, particularly difficult where reciprocal systems of informal social welfare are highly relied upon. Uh, third, informal taxation is prevalent. So based on the limited research that has been done in this area, we know that most people pay them. You know, uh, the only cross-country evidence that we have to date have, was done by Olken, Olken and Singhal in 2011, published in 2011. Uh, they find that informal tax payments are widespread in rural areas, uh, reaching over 50% of households in some countries, including Ethiopia, Indonesia, and Vietnam, uh, and an average of 20% in all countries under study. In my research in Sierra Leone, uh, I, I likewise find that they are prevalent. Uh, you know, only 4% of taxpayers report paying any direct tax to the central government, and households paid uh, reported paying less than $1 in taxes and fees to the local government. But almost 70% of households reported having paid at least one informal tax or user fee in the previous year. Uh, in some areas, because of com the prevalence of communal labor, informal tax payment in Sierra Leone is almost universal. Uh, similarly, in my research in South Central Somalia, we find that more than 70% of households reported paying at least one informal tax or fee in the previous year, and ICTD research in the DRC comes to similar conclusions. Uh, fourth, uh, informal taxation can be linked with greater taxpayer trust. So in Sierra Leone, for example, we find that taxpayers have significantly greater trust in informal taxes relative to formal taxes across a range of measures. So they have more positive perceptions of uh, or greater trust in informal taxing actors. They have more positive perceptions of the fairness uh, and the transparency of informal tax rate setting, uh, of the fairness of collection. Um, and uh, they're more likely to believe that they'll get something in return for informal tax payment relative to formal taxes. Similar findings emerge in my research in Somalia, uh, where it's perhaps unsurprising that people have much less trust in state actors uh, and state taxation than they do in community-based taxation that's led by clan and community leaders. Now, finally, I want to highlight that these outcomes are highly context specific. So informal systems of finance are embedded in local institutions. Uh, thus, there's, there's a great deal of variation in how they operate, how they're enforced, and how they are uh, linked to public goods outcomes. Research thus far has focused on understanding how these systems operate in different contexts. Uh, but because of the context specific nature of informal institutions, it can be difficult to point to generalizable findings. We'll come back to this point in talking about directions for future research in this area. Two other key findings from existing research are worth exploring in greater detail. First, the implications of informal taxation for equity, and second, the implications for gender. First, let's consider who pays informal taxes and what implications this has for redistribution and equity. Now, earlier accounts of informal taxation, largely anthropological accounts, uh, showed that uh, informal taxes could be less regressive than the formal tax system on account of uh, informal taxing actors being embedded within communities, um, perhaps being more responsive to local needs, being able to enact informal exemptions uh, and, to, and to uphold principles of local moral economies. Uh, broader evidence, uh, including more recent empirical analysis, however, shows that uh, informal taxation and revenue generation is often regressive in its impact, meaning that lower income households and individuals pay more in informal taxes and fees in relation to their incomes than high income households and individuals. Um, this reflects the fact that uh, informal taxes are often levied at flat rates, flat, they, they represent flat fees, so they, uh, they effectively have a higher, or they represent a higher, uh, a heavier burden on low-income households. So in my research in Somalia, uh, and as shown in the figure, uh, lower-income households bear a disproportionately higher burden of informal contributions as a proportion of their income relative to higher-income households. 
uh, in research in the DRC, uh, in Kinshasa, in Goma, we find that low-income households pay up to 20% of households' expenditures in overall taxes and informal taxes, a much higher percent than higher income households. And similarly, in Sierra Leone, the poorest fifth of households paid reported paying double in informal taxes and user fees than the, um, than the richest fifth of households. So aside from the uneven individual level distribution of informal taxes, when informal revenue generation replaces a centralized system of taxation and redistribution or fills gaps where that system doesn't exist, it has unequal community level effects. So when the responsibility for financing public goods falls on individuals, falls on households and communities rather than on the state, access to public goods and the quality of those public goods in any area will evidently depend on the relative wealth of the local community, implying uneven distributional effects within countries uh, and, and within a subnational regions. You know, essentially where there is no centralized redistribution system, uh, communities will have unequal capacity to fill the revenue and service provision gaps left by the state uh, with, with really important implications for who has access to public goods and for the quality of those public goods that are available. Now, in addition to the negative equity impacts of informal taxes, I also want to highlight the potentially negative impacts on gender outcomes. Now, research in this area on the gendered impacts of informal taxes is limited, uh, but early evidence from Sierra Leone suggests that informal taxes can have a heavier impact on women. Uh, this is based on gender analysis that I did in the context of Sierra Leone. In, 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 this, in this study, I found that female-headed households pay fewer formal taxes and user fees than male-headed households, which is relatively unsurprising as women have lower incomes and are more likely to fall under formal tax thresholds. But I also find that female-headed households are more likely to pay more informal taxes and user fees to access public goods and services. Not only do they pay more, but they pay more in relation to their income. There's also abundant evidence that women play a critical role in communal level forms of self-help and public service provision that involve levying informal user fees and often involve uh, a heavy burden in terms of time and labor. Uh, this is particularly the case, for instance, with respect to the uh, management of schools uh, and, and water wells in, in local communities. To summarize, while observers and policymakers often assume that most people in low-income countries, and particularly low-income people and those working in the informal economy, don't pay taxes, uh, we know that this doesn't tell the full story. While people often don't pay much informal taxes, they often face a heavy burden of informal taxation. This is the case when thinking about workers in the informal economy. Not only may they be paying a range of informal taxes to contribute to local public goods like schools and roads, they are likely often making a range of other payments to state and non-state actors to operate their businesses. Now, if we don't understand the reality of informal taxation, it can lead us to misunderstand what is necessary for tax policy. You first, not including user fees and informal taxes in analyses of taxation in low-income countries will leave us with an incomplete picture of tax burdens, as well as the broader inequities that may be embedded in both formal and informal structures and institutions. We really need to understand real fiscal burdens in order to understand how new tax policies or administrative reforms may contribute to that burden. This is especially true for policies focused on taxing the informal economy. Introducing new taxes on informal workers may simply increase their burden of contributions without necessarily improving public goods provision or providing reciprocal benefits to them. Overall, this can increase the inequity in the tax system. Now, if policymakers undertake specific policy reform without understanding these realities, they may misunderstand why policies aren't effective as they expect. So Max pointed out earlier that taxing the informal economy often doesn't lead to the anticipated revenue gains. 
policymakers may think that these failures merely reflect insufficient enforcement and may thus increase pressure on informal workers to pay. If we don't understand their existing informal burdens, we may misunderstand the reasons why they don't want to pay new formal taxes in the first place. Overall, we need to understand the realities of informal taxation and revenue generation in order to understand the institutional context of policy reforms, particularly uh, in thinking about potential constituents that may be resistant to reform. Whether these are overburdened taxpayers or informal taxing actors that may be reluctant to give up their roles and the revenues associated with them. Now, to conclude, Max and I want to take a minute to uh, highlight what we see as a useful research agenda for those that are interested in issues of informality and taxation. First, I'll identify a few key questions that we see as particularly important to move this research agenda forward. First, we want to draw attention to the equity implications of taxing the informal economy. Uh, we see it really important uh, for there to be more research that explores the complexity of the informal economy and adds nuance to policy discussions around taxation uh, in this sector. In particular, we see a need for research that explores the equity implications of various efforts at formalization, uh, including taxpayer registration drives, uh, improved tax compliance and, and tax enforcement, uh, presumptive taxation, and associational taxation. Uh, second, uh, we want to draw attention to the importance of informal taxation and redistribution. As I noted earlier, informal revenue generation produces uh, negative equity outcomes, uh, it, though overall its distributional effects are poorly understood. At the same time, while I noted that uh, re some research suggests that women face a higher burden of informal taxation than men, very little is understood about why this may be the case and whether this is a consistent pattern across diverse contexts. Accordingly, we would really like to see more research that probes both the distinctive patterns of informal revenue generation uh, and the underlying effect factors that shape it, as well as the uh, implications that these factors have for equity outcomes. Finally, uh, we would like to see more research on informal tax and citizen state relationships. Uh, indeed, we see that uh, we see informal taxation and revenue generation as a, as a way in which to study, as a way through which to study citizen state relationships, particularly at the local level, where the majority of informal taxes and fees are, are collected in low income countries. Um, accordingly, we, th we think that research may usefully explore the relationship between informal taxation and revenue generation uh, and decentralization in these contexts. Now, with that, I will pass it to Max to discuss uh, how we think research may best address some of these important questions. Thank you, Vanessa. Well, especially for us as a research institution, the challenge that really comes out of all these discussions is the question, how can research help us address these issues? And how can research help us address these questions better? We've spent a lot of time in this lecture talking about some of the challenges that have existed in previous research on this. Um, so the, we want to end with this question of, well, how would research have to look a little bit differently to help us contribute to these conversations a little bit better? And some of the key themes that have come out of, of work on this in the last couple of years have been highlighting the potential for multidisciplinary research and mixed method research. Um, and, and it's come out of this, this realization that there have been very segmented and siloed conversations around informal intertaxation in, in different areas of scholarship that don't often talk to each other as much as they should. And that as a consequence, these different areas have often relied on very different assumptions, assumptions that could be broken up a little bit more if there was more engagement across disciplines. Similarly, there's real value in more engagement across different geographic regions, more collaborative research, but also more engagement between academic work, policy work, and civil society and activist organizations on the ground that really understand the context they work in. Because the, the fundamental challenge that really seems to come out of a lot of the discussions in this lecture 
has been that we still want to engage with these large questions around informality and taxation and the policy consequences that come from it. But we shouldn't lose track of the diverse, complex empirical realities of what it means to be informal in a particular sector, in a particular context, of the huge diversity that we see in informal taxation, the complexity of it. So building research not just on assumptions, but on a detailed understanding of bottom-up realities and still connecting to these large global questions and the practical consequences that follow from them for policymakers is going to need to be a communal effort. And it's going to need a lot of people involved in it from a diverse context. And that really seems to be one of the key challenges for this area of research going forward. We'll leave you with that. Um, we hope that you found something in this lecture uh, that was interesting, exciting, challenging, or is leading you to ask more questions around informality and tax. We'll leave you with a couple of slides that has a bit more uh, reading and a bit more references, but we really want to point you to the wider materials that are available on the ICTD informality and tax capacity building website. Um, we hope that you find some of that interesting. We hope that this might motivate you to uh, get involved in research in this area. And if you do, we really hope to hear from you. And with that, thank you very much for listening.